Let's go to God in a word of prayer. God, we love you and we thank you and we appreciate you for allowing us to be here on this day, to allow us to be able to know you, to be called by your name, to be called Christians. God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. And I'm praying for this celebration for everyone online and in person that you give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand, and a heart to accept your word. Be with me that I proclaim your word as boldly as I should. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. So here we've been on a series, and what we did first, the series was called The Lord of the Harvest, where we looked at how God is the Lord of the harvest and how he should send out laborers or how we should pray for him to send out laborers to his harvest. And then next we went to another series called I'll be a witness. And there we were inspired and we were encouraged to share our testimony, to be witnesses for God. And then for the past two weeks, Bishop Lovelace, he just came and messed us up and showed us how our witness as a church, as a collective, has impact not only on this church, not only for believers, but it has implications for our community, it has implications for our nations, and implications for our world. And so here what we're looking at today is we're going to be looking at how we can witness through our generosity, how we can use our finances, how we can use our resources resources as a way to witness to others by giving through the church. Now, the title of the message today is The Power of Giving. That's the power of giving. And in our culture today, we celebrate giving. People love giving. If you tell someone that you gave to an organization or to a person, then they're going to be excited. We're in a culture that love when people give, so much so that the biggest YouTube stars are people who actually just give stuff away. They have millions, hundred million followers, and all they do is they give away money, thousands of dollars. They give away cars to people. They give away homes. They even start giving away islands and planes and exotic cars, right? They took it to another level. But everyone watches because they love to see people being generous and people being able to receive things. So we live in a culture where if you talk about giving money to a nonprofit organization, giving money to people, we live in a culture where that is highly celebrated, where you will be commended, where people will be excited when you talk about giving. But when it comes to the church, the world does not look at that from the same perspective. If you go and tell people that you gave to the church, a lot of people will start and they'll hit you with some skepticism, right? Well, you give into the church. Why are you giving to the church? Some people will go and they'll hit you with some criticism saying you should not be giving your money to the church. You should be doing something else with your money. And then some people will hit you with some cynicism which means they just have a hatred, a strong dislike. They like, I can't believe you. You so stupid for doing this, and that's not smart, and that's the worst place you can give your money to. And so when I'm looking at it, I'm wondering, why do people have so much disdain against people giving to the church. If you go on YouTube right now and you type in giving to the church, you won't get a bunch of sermons, but instead what you'll get is a bunch of people talking about why you should not give to the church and why it is terrible to give 
to the church. So if I'm looking at the reason why this is, on the surface, people can say, oh, it's because of televangelists or megachurch pastors, or it's because of the pastors that have private jets. Or some people will say, oh, it's because of the prosperity gospel and how some people just go in there and they're preaching health and wealth and every single sermon is about money and giving. Then thirdly, some people might say, well, it's because of the historical abuses. I heard about a church that did wrong, or I was part of a church that mismanaged finances, and so now I have this negative perspective about giving, and that's on the surface. But if you take a look beneath the surface, I believe that there is something a lot deeper going on. I believe that the enemy knows that that one of the best ways to attack the church is to attack its resources. If you want to stop an organization from growing, all you have to do is start messing with their money and their finances because they cannot fund the vision that they have. In the same way, if you ask some people about pastors, they say, oh yeah, pastors, they just mansions and, and jets. And I'm like, I know thousands of pastors, right? They None of them got no jet, right? If they did, I'd ask them if I could ride on it, but they don't, right? And so, and so looking at it, what the world will do is they'll take a select few people and they'll try to make that as the whole, where most pastors are not even able to do it full time. Most of them have another part-time God and they're struggling to make ends meet and they're underpaid, but that's not the message that is given out. Most churches are preaching and teaching the gospel, right? And not just a prosperity gospel, but that's not the message that is going out. And all churches aren't going out there and abusing money and finances, but that's not the message that is going out. Why? Because the enemy is trying to wage war against the church. And in war, there's a tactic called like a besiege. And what that means is what you'll try to do is instead of going and directly attacking the enemy, instead you will cut off the enemy's resources. And when you cut off their resources, resources, they have no way to take care of themselves and they'll end up surrendering. So sometimes people will just go and surround the city, cut off their resources, and the and, and, and then the city will come out and they'll say, we surrender, we give up. Why? Because we need resources. In the same way, it's a similar tactic that America has taken to Russia to where they say, okay, well, we're not going to come over there and do anything, but but we're going to try to turn off your resources. We're going to try to mess with your money because we know if we could cut your resources, we can impact you in a negative direction. And so when you look at church giving, having such a negative perspective, perception in our culture, I say it's deeper than just some abuses and misuses of a select few people. And it is a tactic of the enemy to cut off our resources because the enemy knows if we have ample resources that we're able to have more impact. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians and meet me at chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we're going to start off in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 8 and 1, it reads, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich, rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also 
to us. So in this passage, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he wants to encourage the church in Corinth to give of their financial resources. So he used chapter 8 and chapter 9 in this book to be able to encourage them to give. In verses 1 through 5, what he does is he used the Macedonian church as an example of generous givers in order to encourage the church in Corinth to give. And so when you're looking at the Macedonian church, what we see in verse number two is that this was a church that was impoverished. This was a church that did not have a lot of resources. Now, the church in Corinth, they actually did have a lot of resources. But in verse number two, it tells us that the Macedonian church, as an example, they faced severe trials, but they still had overflowing joy. They had trials, they had tribulations, but they still had joy. And the reason that it talks about this is it's trying to get you to understand that it did not matter what was going on around them, but really how they were able to be impacted or really what happened was they were still able to have joy because joy is something that was inside of them. It was not based off of what was going on around them. It was not based off of their circumstance, right? Happiness is based off of what's happening, but joy is internal and is constant, meaning no matter what is going on, you can still have joy because you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Lord. Lord and Savior. In the same way, we know that even in the midst of our grief as Christians, we still have access to joy because we know that God is still on the throne. And as long as he's on the throne, then we still have hope. So that's what it talks about in verse number two. And then verse number three, what it says is it talks about how much they gave. It says they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They gave as much as they were able to give and even beyond their ability. So this church that was poor, they didn't look at their lack of resources and say, oh, because we don't have resources, we're not going to give anything. But instead, they said, we're still going to give because we know that our giving, our generosity is not based off of what we have, but it's based off of our heart and it's based off of who we are. And so people can't look at what they have, right? If you have a lot, then feel like, okay, well, I can give a lot, right? Or if you have a little, well, now I can't give anything. No, they gave even out of their poverty, and they gave as much as they were able to give and even beyond that. So a lot of times when people ask about giving and how much they should give in a church, they're trying to figure out, like, what's the minimum amount? Like, like, what's the least amount I can be able to give and, like, still be cool and all right, right? Because I want to be generous, but what's the, literally the smallest amount that I could give and still be considered generous? But this is not what they did. They gave as much as they were able to give. And I had a friend and my friend, we were talking a few years ago and they would say, yeah, giving is all about coming from your heart, right? You give whatever is in your heart. And I was like, hey man, that's the gospel right there. You give whatever is in your heart. And then they started talking and they were like, yeah, so if I give 1% or 2% or 3% and that's what's in my heart, then that's good. And it's like, well, I don't think that's what the scripture was necessarily Lee was talking about when it was talking about giving this from your heart. You know, you get $5,000 and you, you say, okay, I'm put this little $50, you know, check in the church or you get $5,000. I'm put a little $50 bill in the church and the church should be happy because I'm being generous, right? When really looking at it, when you get New Testament examples of being generous, what you have in Acts chapter 2 is you have people that were selling their 
homes because they believe in the message and the mission of the gospel. When you have the Macedonian church, you have people who was given all that they had, and then they were even given beyond their ability. And all throughout Scripture, when we have any example of giving, we see people being very generous, right? And so then when we turn around and say, well, I'm I'm just going to give a little one or two percent, it's like, all right, if that's what the Lord put on your heart, then that's what you could give. But even looking from an Old Testament perspective, they gave 10% of all they had. And then from a New Testament perspective, they gave well above that 10% mark. And so here, looking at a heart to give is saying people not looking at what's the minimum that you can give, but how much you can give. And for the church, in order for us to be considered generous from a scriptural perspective, perspective, we should look at how can I give at least 10% of my income, which is the minimum that people were given, even in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they were given so much more because they believed in the church. And then in verse number four, what happened was it says they gave on their own. They earnestly pleaded for the privilege to share in giving. So this is saying the Macedonian church, they didn't need anybody to fire them up, right? They didn't need somebody to preach real good and do a dynamic sermon and tell them that they should give and just really inspire them. They said, no, they were going up to the Apostle Paul and they were saying, we want to give. And they gave as much as they could. So giving should not be anything that somebody is trying to force you to do or beat you over the head to do. Instead, it should be something that we want to do. And then it says in verse number five that they exceeded expectations and they gave themselves. And so I like that they exceeded the expectations of the apostles. Like the apostle Paul got there and he could not believe how generous this church was. He could not believe how much they were willing to sacrifice. He couldn't believe how much they believed in the kingdom of God and how much they wanted to help support the kingdom of God and help the church to be able to grow. And then it says that they gave of themselves. So it's saying not only did they go and they um, gave their finances, but it says they gave their finances because they gave of themselves. Now, in the gospel, when you're looking at it, when we come and we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that we are not our own. We're acknowledging that we can't do it by ourselves. We're acknowledging that we need a Savior. We're acknowledging that we need to turn our life over to Christ. When we get water baptized, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that our old self is going and dying and we're raising up a new creation or a a, a new person. And so we're acknowledging all of these things and we say, God, I surrender all and I surrender to you. And so we have this mentality where Jesus Christ comes and he says, whoever wants to follow after me, you must pick up your cross daily. You must die to yourself daily and pick up your cross and follow after me. To be a Christian is to surrender everything to say, God, I no longer live for myself, but instead I live for you. And I believe that we all want to get to that point and we want to say, God, I want to be as close to you as I can. I want to read as much as I can, get as much word as I can. As much as your word, I want to um, pray as much as I can. I want to be as spiritually close to you as I can. And so then what we have to say is, do we have that same mentality when it comes to our resources and our finances where we say, God, that job that I have, I know you gave me the job. That promotion that they gave me, I know that promotion came from you. 
God, I know I was praying on a raise and it came and everything that I have, it comes from you. And so when I'm given to the church and I'm given to the kingdom of God, when I'm given to God, all I'm doing is I'm giving back a portion of what God already gave to me. God said, here go the job. You could take that job. Here goes the raise. You could take that raise. Here go the promotion. You take that promotion. God blesses you and we turn around and we say, oh, God gave me a thousand dollars, I give him a hundred. God gave me ten thousand, I give I give him a thousand. God gave me a hundred thousand, I give him ten thousand back of which he already gave to me, right? Because we're giving of ourselves. Continuing on looking at verse number six and seven, it reads, so we urge Titus just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled for you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And so there it was saying that the church in Corinth, if you read the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you'll see that they love spiritual gifts and anybody who could prophesy in the service, a bunch of people jumping up prophesying, a bunch of people jumping up speaking in tongues, a bunch of people jumping up and wanting to use their spiritual gifts to be a prophet, to preach, to teach, and do all of these things. And he's telling this church, since you're excelling in everything, else, that you're trying to do everything else to the best of your ability, I also want you to go and excel in the act of giving. He's saying, I want it to be your mission for you to excel in giving just like you try to make it your mission to excel in everything else. And so then looking at this, it also says that you excel in this grace of giving. And I like how the passage talks about the grace of giving, because oftentimes when we think of grace, we think of something we receive. We like, ooh, I got some grace, right? God gave me grace. I'm so happy I got grace. And yes, God is giving you a gift that you do not deserve, right? That is salvation. God gave you salvation. And so now we are appreciative that God gave us grace. But then when it comes to giving, what it's saying is giving is an opportunity for us to go and extend that grace to others. And I say when you give to the church, what happens is you're, you're given to a space that able to help extend grace to others. In our other sermon series, we talked about what you can do as an individual, how you can reach one person, how you could talk to your neighbor or your co-worker. But what you can do as one person is not as powerful as what we can all do as a church. And so when it's talking about the grace of giving, what it's saying is let's take our resources, let's take our finances, let's put it all in one pot, let's put it together in the church, and then let's use that as a way to extend grace to others. So anytime anyone is given to a church or especially given here to Center of Praise Ministries, what you're doing is you're helping to extend grace to others. You have an impact because lives are being changed here. Bodies are being healed here. That's why next week, that's why next week we're having our healing and praise celebration, and we will have about 20 people that will now come and accept Center of Praise as their new church home. 20 people that said they wanted to go and join Center of Praise. That's why last time we had water baptisms, it was over 20 people that wanted to go and be water baptized. That's why after each celebration, you see people come into the altar. That's why we're able to have such an impact in our community. Why? Because we're using the resources that people here have given generously, and we're using that to extend grace to others. And that's why, 
the most powerful thing you can do with your finances is not to spend it, but to give it. And the most powerful place that you can give to is the church. The reason that is, is because it, it has an eternal impact. We're able to have eternal impact when we go and we give to the church. We're able to extend this grace to others. So when people say, why should I give to the church? I say, there's no greater place to give. And then it starts to make sense when it's in Acts chapter 2 and they sell in their houses. I'm like, let me read that again. Like, you just going to sell your property? Like, you, you selling all your gold and jewelry? Why? Because you believe in the mission, right? Why are you going? Why did the Macedonian church that's so poor why are you sitting up there giving um, all that you can? And even beyond your ability, you're stretching yourself, stretching your finances to give to the church because they believed in the mission. They wanted to extend grace to others. And that's why the church was growing so rapidly in the first century. If you look at it, it wasn't just because they were going up there and they were, and they were going and they were preaching and teaching the gospel. It's because they had people that were extremely generous. And as people were being generous, then they were going and the church was able to spread right? Y'all with me? We back? All right. So, so looking at it, that's, that's why it was able to spread so rapidly, not only because they said it with their words, but because they put their money where their mouth was. And they said, not only do we believe in this so much that what we're going to do is we're going to pour our finances into it. And that makes me think, how much would we be able to do here as a church if we had more resources and finances? Now, I already told you what we're doing. We're already having a big impact. We're already helping people to be transformed. We're already growing as a church. And the more resources we have, the more we are able to grow. I think about what would it look like for our children's ministry to have more resources, right? What would it look like for our youth ministry to have more resources, right? What would our young adults ministry look like if they had more resources? And so looking at that next, let's go to verses number eight and nine. And the Apostle Paul says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Amen. And what I like about this is the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm not commanding you to give. You don't have to give. It's not a requirement that everyone must give. There's not a commandment to give, but instead he indicates that I would like to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it to others, right? He's saying love will compel you to give. It's not that we have a commandment to give. It's not that if we don't give 10%, God is going to strike us down or be mad at us. It's that the love that God poured out to us, we should be willing to pour it back out to him and pour it back out to others. And then in this passage, I like that it says that God isn't asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done. So when you're looking at it, the example is the Lord Jesus Christ who was in heaven. We're talking about streets of gold. We're talking about the crystal sea. We're talking about at the right hand of God on the throne, all power and authority. And Jesus could have sat right there and said, I'm good and I'm chilling. But instead he looked at each and every one of us and he said, I will empty myself of all of these things that I have. I will be born a human. I will be born in a manger, right? And then I will walk 
walk not as a rich man, but as a poor man. Jesus over there walking on his bare feet, right? He the son of God walking on his bare feet. But he said that he would literally come and empty himself. And the reason that he did that, this passage saying, said Jesus became poor so that all of us could become rich. So he gave up all of his pleasures so that we could have a chance at eternal salvation or an opportunity at eternal salvation. So in the same way, the apostle is looking at each and every one of us, and he's encouraging us to become like Jesus Christ. He's saying, don't get so caught up in this world that is temporary, that you are just going around and, and, and seeking after worldly pleasures. Don't get so caught up on what's the biggest house you can afford, what's the nicest car you can afford. I know you have have your vision board, and I know you have your dream car, and I know you have your ideal home, but also with that, we should also have in our mind that we want to be generous givers, saying, God, on my dream board, on my vision board, I want to give generously to you. I want to give generously to the church because I know that when I give to the church, that lives will be changed, that bodies will be healed, that souls will be saved, that people will be transformed, that it will have eternal impact. And so God is looking at each and every one of us and he's saying, are you willing to be generous, right? And we're looking at the Jesus Christ and what he did. We're looking at the Macedonian church and what they did. And that should encourage us. That should propel us. When we look at Acts chapter 2 and what they did, that should encourage us to be generous. Now, when I'm talking about being generous right now, right? Now, if somebody went and said, oh, I sold my house, right? I kind of looked at you like you're funny. Like, oh, you, you took that literal, right? I know that's what they was doing, and I know what that's what it's saying, but I ain't expect you to just go and sell your house, right? You just sold the house, the car, everything. Don't be coming knocking on my door talking about, can you get a place to stay, right? You just sold everything. But really what this message should do is it should encourage us to look at how can I do more, It should encourage us to change our vision to say it's not just about gaining more material things on this earth, but my vision is about the kingdom of God and how I can sow into the church more. The vision should be, okay, I know my giving isn't where I want it to be, but I'm going to give it there. I know my giving's at 2% now, but it's going to be at 5% by the end of the month, right? It's at 5% now, but I'm going to get it to that 10% that that they were at in the Old Testament. I know some people like, oh, my giving been at 10% for the last 20 years, but I'm just believing in God to bless me in a way where I could go above and beyond the tithe to be able to give generously because I know that when I give generously that it will have impact. So just like the first century church, let's look at all that we have as resources to be planted in the kingdom of God for the purposes of souls being saved.